This is the base 13 inch M3 MacBook Air, which is the newest product that I've been testing. I'm currently away from the office visiting my family and left home my M3 Pro 14 inch to daily drive this machine. I've been using this for about two weeks, which I don't think is enough time to call this a full review, but I can share some valuable information that will help you decide which MacBook is best for you. This is Apple's smallest and thinnest MacBook that's been the perfect travel machine for me. I bought this so that I could review it for you guys and understand whether 8 gigabytes is actually as bad as everyone says. I knew that even the base M chips were super powerful for most tasks, but it's been able to keep up with my workflow around 80% of the time, which for a base model is saying a lot. With the right upgrades, I think this could make more sense than the MacBook Pro for a lot of people. So the M3 MacBook Air looks identical on the outside to the M2 version. That's because it's using the same updated look we saw coming from the old wedge design on the M1. This gave us the more squared off flat design, an updated 1080p webcam, a slightly larger screen with thinner bezels thanks to the notch, and MagSafe. This base model retails for $1099, which for what you actually get in terms of performance is not bad. That said, you do need to consider the value for money compared to an older M1 or M2 model that you can grab at a steep discount going for a refurbished one. This spec only gives you 256 gigabytes of internal storage, which I think is far too little if you're doing more than simple web browsing and admin work. The cost for storage upgrades is ridiculous because you're adding $200 on top of the MSRP just for 5 12 gigabytes, but I think this is a much more comfortable choice and is what I have in my 14 inch. The only positive with this base model is the 256 gigabyte SSD is no longer significantly slower than the higher capacities as it gets two NAND chips. The M2 with the same spec only had one, you had to upgrade to 512 or higher to get two. This drive is still a lot slower than the M3 Pro in my tests, about 75% slower writes and 60% slower read speeds, but in day to day use, this hasn't been an issue. The only time this would really become a problem is if you're transferring over a large file onto the internal drive. Aside from that, the only real limitations you'll notice compared to the MacBook Pro is the refresh rate and lesser number of ports. This 60Hz display really isn't bad though. It of course doesn't feel as fluid as ProMotion, but the difference isn't as drastic as I expected it to be. Ports are by far the biggest pain point for me though. I actually use the SD card slot quite a lot and hook up to my single monitor over HDMI whenever editing color. Having just two Thunderbolts leaves you pretty limited, though with MagSafe, you can still connect to power and not have to sacrifice one of those. Looking at the exterior, I have the Mac in this space gray finish, which looks clean, but I do wish they had something closer to space black, as I've fallen in love with that color. After I'm done testing this machine, it will mostly become a travel laptop for me, and that's partly because it's much thinner, which makes slipping it into a bag a ton easier, especially if I'm going on a trip where I want to load up my bag and still have easy access to my laptop. The only downside with this is it won't fit nicely within some docks. For example, my walnut dock from GroveMade is too wide for it. More importantly for travel though is this lightweight build. It comes in at 0.8 pounds or 0.36 kilograms lighter than the MacBook Pro, which doesn't sound like much, but I found the difference to be very noticeable. It was much more comfortable to have in my lap at the airport. Having this laptop at times like this is perfect for handling admin work, and this is where today's sponsor UPDF comes in. They've created an AI-powered PDF viewer that can translate and summarize your documents, as well as annotate, edit, convert, sign, protect, and organize them. Working with PDFs can often be a pain, but using UPDF, it's easy to make edits to text and images. You can highlight important sections, add a sticky note, and easily sign documents. UPDF also makes it easy to fill out and create PDF forms, which makes gathering info much simpler. Any PDF document that you import can easily be converted to your preferred file type, and images can be scanned using OCR to turn them into editable PDF documents. UPDF AI is very useful if you have something like a guide or ebook as you can translate it into your native language and then have AI summarize or answer specific questions for you. If you go to the first link in the description, you can get an exclusive discount on UPDF Pro that with a single license lets you use it across all supported platforms. So I went with the smaller 13 inch display again as this was meant to be more of a travel laptop. This is the same 500 nit liquid retina display from last year that quite honestly surprised me with just how good it looked. On the MacBook Pro's mini LED display, you do have deeper blacks than this IPS panel, but for most scenarios, this isn't a problem. The only significant difference is with that 60Hz refresh rate. This is fine for admin work, but when video editing or even designing, having to zoom in and out, I do notice that it's less fluid. Now, with this being a 13.6 inch display, it's actually very close in size to the 14. You have slightly thicker bezels, but the amount of available screen real estate feels practically the same. That said, on such a small screen, trying to multitask or do any sort of work that requires 
requires multiple panels, like video editing, it does feel very cramped. If you're constantly doing work like this off the display, the 15 inch model could be worth looking at. With the M3, a significant upgrade that could be a reason to go with it over the M2 is support for external displays. When the lid's closed, you can connect up to two 6K displays at 60 hertz, but with it open, it's still limited to just one. This means that you'll need to have some wireless peripherals or pick up a dock that you can plug them into. Now, let's talk specifically about the performance I've seen with the M3 chip. Honestly, I haven't perceived much of a difference in day-to-day -day use compared to my M3 Pro. Looking at synthetic benchmarks, the Geekbench scores show the M3 and M3 Pro are very close in terms of single core performance, with the M3 being just 2.4% slower. There's a 16% jump in performance from the M2 and a much more significant 62% jump from the M1. Looking to multi-core performance, the M3 is about 14% slower than the M3 Pro. This is the base chip, by the way. 22% faster than the M2 and a whopping 228% faster than the M1. While there is a bump from the M2 to the M3, I don't think it's enough to justify that extra money, at least without looking at GPU performance. This is the one area which could make the M3 a better choice depending on your workflow. The M3 series chips have hardware accelerated ray tracing and dynamic caching, which gives big performance jumps in apps that take advantage of it. My workflow doesn't consist of any apps like Blender, but watching Kyle Erickson's video on the M3, he saw some pretty significant improvements with it. Of course, synthetic benchmarks can only tell you so much, so I wanted to put this base model to the test. I edited my last video in DaVinci Resolve, and it actually handled it pretty well. To be fair, my workflow isn't anything crazy, I just have a couple of layers of 4K H.264 footage with some music and voiceover tracks, along with some text effects layered on top. That said, I was still impressed, and working off of the display, editing was completely fine on here. I had the occasional lag spike, but it was nothing crazy, that was until I hooked it up to my external monitor. It seems that trying to edit a video while connected to an external display, plus having a few apps open, was just too much for this machine. I was having some severe performance issues where it pretty much was unusable. What's worth noting is this 8GB of RAM is unified memory, meaning that it has to be shared between the CPU and GPU, so multitasking with such a small amount is going to be difficult. I eventually had to go back to my M3 Pro to finish the edit, but I think that if I had 16GB of RAM, it would have handled it perfectly. A lot of the time, I was working just off of the battery, and this will be an advantage over the more powerful M3 Pro. Comparing its rated battery life to the M2, it has the same 18 hours of video playback, which means that the M3 is more efficient. Essentially, we're getting more power without losing any battery. In light work, just inside of Notion with some arc tabs open, the battery lasted about an entire workday, but with something like video editing, it was probably closer to 5 or 6. For the most part though, I was always near a charger, so I could easily hook up to MagSafe. It's also worth mentioning that the memory bandwidth is 100 gigabytes per second, compared to 150 on the M3 Pro, or up to 400 on the M3 Max. Also, if you're in a heavy workload, the fanless design can heat up a lot quicker, which will ultimately cause some amount of thermal throttling, but for most use cases, this is not something that you'll have to worry about. So with all that said, let's answer the question of who is this MacBook actually for? In my opinion, the biggest reason that I could see this being worth the upgrade is for that dual monitor support. Going for an M3 MacBook Air with 16GB of RAM and a 512GB SSD, it brings you fairly close to the 14 inch in terms of specs, and you're still paying $500 less. You can then pocket that difference and invest it into a high quality dock like something from CalDigit, along with some nice peripherals. Additionally, if you're doing work in a GPU heavy application like Blender, because of the M3's better GPU performance, that could be the deciding factor even if you're on the M2, which otherwise is going to be very similar performance wise in most workflows. Assuming you have a capable router though, Wi-Fi 6E could be a reason to upgrade, as a lot of us rely on fast internet to work efficiently. If none of the previous things are that important to you, I think there's a few better options that can save you quite a bit of cash. First, if you're looking for just straight value for money, you can grab the M1 Air renewed for $640 right now, which is a fantastic deal. You aren't getting the updated design with the higher quality microphone or webcam, but if you're a student or someone on a tight budget, this is a great choice. I think any MacBook Air with 16 gigabytes of RAM is gonna be more than enough for most people, but if you do require more performance, I saw a renewed M1 Pro for just over 1200 bucks with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD. That machine is still insanely powerful, my 16 inch one that I use for work is great, and you have all the added benefits of the MacBook Pro, that being ProMotion, added ports, and extra display compatibility. For me, I still will be using the M3 Pro as a daily machine because I kind of need that power, but if I just want to go on a short trip or only need to do some light admin work, this is the perfect machine. It's crazy just how much power is enclosed in such a slim and lightweight design. Since I started testing this laptop, I've been pairing it with my S24 Ultra, 
And so if you want to see what that daily carry has looked like, go watch last week's video. Take care.